It is a pleasure for me to be here today at this conference organized by the National Bank of Belgium, the Toulouse and Solvay Schools of Economics and the European Central Bank. Of course, I would like to thank the, the organization for giving me the opportunity to chair this panel, dealing with an issue that uh, over the last years has been permanently in the spotlight, the appropriateness of the EU architecture to deal with future financial crises. I was recently appointed deputy um, governor at Banco de España, um, but to, I mean, for the, the other part of my career, I've been a supervisor. <laughs> I've worked in banking supervision, both at Banco de España and more recently, uh, for almost five years at the ECB, at the, I mean, in, in the setup of the, of the SSM. Of course, for a supervisor, today's topic is not an easy one. Discussing about how to deal with financial crisis is a rather painful experience, and I have suffered um, a personal experience during the, the crisis in Spain, because this involves, um, to a certain extent, the recognition of a failure of supervision. Of course, the work of supervisors is essentially a preventive one, um, that is to say, to try to prevent financial crisis, from occurring or, at a minimum, minimize their consequences. If successful, supervision is a silent work that should go quite unnoticed for the public. Indeed, it is generally a bad signal when supervisors receive a lot of attention from the media. On the other hand, I guess we cannot expect any sign of appreciation from the public from preventing, for preventing financial crises because maybe nobody has been aware of them. Of course, and maybe linking to the topic today, the solvency of the financial sector is deeply interlinked with the health of the economic environment in which it operates. At the same time, the financial system is a significant contributor to the economy, either in a positive or negative way. As supervisors, we must strive to avoid the accumulation of imbalances in the financial sector. The objective is to have a strong and sound financial system, which can help to mitigate an, event, an eventual economic crisis instead of contributing to it as, it, as a procyclical factor or even magnifying its consequences. At the same time, regulation and supervision tend to have a natural micro perspective. Namely, the objective would be to assess and enhance each individual bank's solvency and business model. According to this micro perspective, risk would be taken as an exogenous phenomenon, meaning that any potential shock triggering a financial crisis would be originated outside the financial crisis. We have also learned, in a rather painful way, that this micro perspective is, at best, only partial. Indeed, if we want to assess risk, particularly systemic risk, we need also a holistic or macroprudential perspective that assesses the interconnections between individual financial institutions and markets, as well as their common exposure to economic risk factors. This has been tackled in the EU, EU by the creation of the ESRB, the development of the national macroprudential authorities, as well as the introduction of macro elements such as leverage limiting caps, regulatory floors, capital buffers, and other uh, items into the regulatory toolkit. Of course, it is often said that in life you shouldn't always expect the best, but be ready for the worst. Likewise, we need to strive for the best common supervision, but institutional arrangements must be ready in case bankruptcies occur. Precisely in the EU financial crisis, the EU financial crisis led to the conviction that a common and enhanced framework for banking supervision and resolution was needed. This conviction was translated into the creation of the single supervisory mechanism and the single sub resolution mechanism which are key components of the banking union. Well, 
We must acknowledge that the Banking Union project was not the result of a joint vision by the EU leaders. Instead, the Banking Union was the result of bold defensive reactions to save the single currency project, taken in the middle of the recent European financial and sovereign crisis. Both the SSM and the SRM have been fully implemented while we were still dealing with the aftermath of this crisis. If we were to look back 10 years, I believe it is fair to say that we have moved a lot. The Banking Union project has changed completely the EU supervisory and resolution frameworks, and I strongly believe these changes are for good. Nonetheless, it is still debatable whether we have gone far enough, in, particular, in particularly in, in the completion of the Banking Union, and the fully EU-funded deposit guarantee scheme, and the, of course, and a fully-fledged resolution fund with real firepower. Should it be needed, in my view, it is, those elements are still pending for the Banking Union. Sadly, the public pressure to implement reforms tends to fade away quite soon when the economy gets back to it on its feet. It is fair to say that the public pressure to fully implement these elements of the Banking Union has lost a lot of steam, and maybe this is rather unfortunate. I recently heard a prominent supervisor say that Banking Union is a sort of being in the middle of the river, halfway between both sides. And this can be an uncomfortable situation when water levels starts to pick up. I'm a bit more positive. I think that we are closer to the other side of the river, but not there yet. We need to press on to do those final meters. I will stop here. It is, it is time to move to our panel discussion. For our discussion today, we have an outstanding re representation from the academic and official sectors. Let me briefly introduce our panelists. And I will start with our first three speakers. Jeromin Settelmeyer is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, based in Washington. During most of his career, Jeromin has worked for the official sector at the IMF, the EBRD, and more recently for the German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, where he was Director General for Economic Policy. He holds an, a PhD in economics from the M MIT. Andres Apir a, is a professor at the Solvay Brussels School of Economics and Management and the Institute for European Studies. He's also a senior fellow at Bruegel and a research fellow at Center for Economic Policy Research in London. Andre was economic advisor to Romano Prodi during his presidency of the European Commission and coordinator of the report on Europe's growth policy, which is known as the Sapir Report. He has also been member of the board of the ESRB. He holds a PhD in economics from the Johns Hopkins University of Baltimore. Our final speaker will be Guido Tabellini, who is professor of economics at Bocconi University and since 2013, in Tessa San Paolo, Chair in Political Economics. His career is mainly linked to the academic world. He has taught in several universities in Italy and the USA, and was also rector at, of Bocconi University from 2008 till 2012. He holds PhD in Economics by the uh, UCLA University. To discuss and confront views with our speakers, we have two discussions whose CVs are by no means less remarkable. As a central banker, it is a pleasure for me to introduce Vitor Constancio. Vitor has been everything in the European Euro system of central banks. First, as deputy governor, and then governor of Banco de Portugal, and more recently, till June this year, as vice president of the ECB, which, at least technically, made Vitor my former boss. Finally, I would like to introduce Olivier Gersent. Well, not Olivier, sorry. <laughs> but, 
Mr. Grassman, who has worked since, um, well, maybe not, not anymore, the, 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 the bio is uh, applicable, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> He's replacing Olivier uh, Garcin, uh, who could not uh, make this appointment in the end. Okay, we have only 90 minutes to uh, cover this controversial um, topic. Well, actually a bit less after my opening remarks. So we'd better start the discussion. And I suggest we, we hear the three presentations from, from our speakers, followed by our discussions. Please, Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Margarita, for the very kind introduction and for pronouncing my name, the Madrid, the Madrid way. So I was actually born in Madrid. Uh, can we eliminate the? Okay. Uh, and uh, Jeromín uh, is the half brother of Philip II, and my mother was working on Spanish portrait painting at the time, so she went a little bit overboard, and I've had to carry that burden uh, ever since. Uh, but for everyone else, uh, Jeremy is, is just fine uh, as, as well. Okay, so I think what you will find is that this... Sh should I speak from here? Yeah, okay. Great. Um, so, so I think you will find that this panel is essentially a continuation of the last panel, right? So there will be some overlap. There will specifically be a little bit of overlap between what I'm going to say and what Beatrice uh, said in the last panel, but hopefully not too much. So I've called my talk, um, Euro Area Governance, a new consensus, two challenges, and an open flank. So, so the new consensus is a somewhat presum presumptuous way of describing the philosophy behind our proposal, the seven plus several proposal, and here the main point I really want to make is that we are not the only ones uh, to have this philosophy. But let me just quickly recap what the philosophy actually is. So it starts from this, you know, rather bland premise that we want both more risk sharing and more discipline, and specifically we would like this discipline to take more of a market form because we don't just want to make rules uh, uh, tougher and tougher. We tried that approach with the fiscal compact. It didn't uh, work very well. Uh, so that's not very original. The, so the new idea, if you like, which is not a new idea, but a relatively new idea in the debate, is that there is really, really no tension. The claim that there is no tension between these two principles. And the reason is that in um, uh, our view and the view of others who have made the same point, risk sharing actually facilitates market discipline by making the no bailout clause credible, right? So when people think of risk sharing as a source of moral hazard, what they think of is the moral hazard caused by the risk sharing arrangement, for example, fiscal transfers. Uh, but there is another effect that on incentives, which is that if you have uh, uh, some element of risk sharing, you may be less under pressure to undertake big bailouts than, than lead to very much and larger transfers to insolvent countries, right? And it is particularly this second form of um, a, a, um, a, you know, transfers that has been viewed, certainly in, in my country, in Germany, as violating the no bailout clause by, by many uh, people. So the idea is if you build this into the system and you, if you do it through arrangements, that um, are carefully designed, for example, by having risk-based insurance premia, by having uh, reinsurance uh, characteristics, by uh, asking for pre-qualification, then you know, the um, moral hazard that comes from that arrangement itself is, is small, and the counterpart of it is that um, you may uh, not have to do uh, as many bailouts which themselves distort incentives. Um, and why is that? Why don't you have to do as many bailouts? Because, this is the 
critical argument with more risk sharing um, along many dimensions, you can then uh, do something which we didn't want to do even in the case of Greece, which is uh, uh, restructure the debts of genuinely insolvent countries. Right? So that's, that's the argument. Now, in order for that to be uh, possible, you have to look at the various channels through which debt restructuring creates costs. It creates costs on the countries themselves. It creates costs on innocent bystanders, contagion, and so forth. And you, so, you need a whole array of risk-sharing uh, mechanisms to pull this off, and so that would include European deposit insurance, um, a fiscal backstop for the SRF, um, some sort of uh, capital markets union, a safe asset, easy access to ESM liquidity, which you need for the contagion, but also a fiscal risk sharing mechanism, at least according to our uh, proposal. And then, you know, in it, once you have all that, um, you know, the, the costs of, of actually allowing genuinely bankrupt countries to go bankrupt are much lower, but, you know, you need, or at least we ask for a little bit more still, which is reducing direct sovereign exposures of banks to their own sovereigns um, as a ne necessary but not sufficient condition to make sovereign debt restructuring feasible as a last resort, and then putting this together with everything else, we think that it does become feasible as a last uh, resort. Now, what you notice here is that I've never used the word debt restructuring regime. And the reason is that in our proposal, at least, we have very little of what people, you know, have been discussing as debt restructuring regime, like a bankruptcy court that makes decisions and allocates losses, right? We have nothing of that. And, and the reason is that we do not believe that the economic costs of debt restructuring, which is what we want to to lower, um, to make it feasible as a last resort, have all that much to do with it. So in terms of formalism, the only thing we do, and this is important, is we essentially advocate the current IMF practice, which is single limb collective action clauses that make it a bit easier to deal with the collection action problem among uncoordinated creditors. And we uh, propose a decision rule for the ESM modeled after the current IMF exceptional access policy, which is that you know, if you're quite, quite sure that the country is really, really insolvent, you should restructure. Uh, if you are fairly confident that it's not, you should not restructure, and if you're not quite sure, you tr should try to extend maturities, right? That's, that's essentially all, all we propose. That's the grand total of our debt restructuring regime, and of course, of course, this is case by case, right? No automaticity, no debt thresholds, none of that uh, sort of thing. Okay, so that's our proposal, but there are other proposals in this uh, philosophy, and, and so I want to show you a few quotes from these other uh, proposals, all around the same idea. So the first nice quote that I could find in this literature is by the paper uh, of May 2010 by Daniel Gross and Thomas Meyer, where they proposed the creation of a European Monetary Fund as a safety net. Uh, and they argued back then that this was not uh, in contradiction with market discipline because market discipline can only be established if default is possible because its costs can be contained. Right? Contained, not reduced to zero, but contained. There's a very similar quote from a, a team based in the IMF's European department. This was sort of the big, first big IMF paper calling for fiscal union of some form. They make exactly the same point, far from diluting market discipline. Insurance with strict ex ante rules could be an improvement over the current situation where the credibility of the no bailout clause has been undermined by ad hoc responses to systemic stress. And we, we put it you know, even shorter, risk sharing and stabilization instruments are necessary for effective discipline. And finally, there's a nice quote by a, um, a paper by three uh, authors from the IMF's research department, uh, and they say, the weak credibility of the no bailout rule stems from a time consistency problem that fiscal risk sharing can ameliorate. Now, all these authors have somewhat different ideas of what risk sharing should be put in place, but the fundamental idea is the same. And I'm not claiming this is exhaustive, so I'm, I'm sure there are at least three people in this room who probably have written papers, and I'm sure Gontram is one of them, uh, that I haven't uh, cited or emphasized enough. So uh, if you are in this crowd, please send me an email um, af after this. Now, there's a little bit of an issue of whether this is just uh, old wine in new 
uh, what, what do you say? Schläuche, uh, what do you say? Bottles, I guess, right? And, and so if you look at the list of actual reforms that we end up advocating, it looks a ton like what has been in the four presidents' report, the five presidents' report, and various European Commission reports, which is, you know, it is capital markets union, fiscal risk sharing, safe asset, and a very gradual reform uh, coordinated with the other stuff of the re regulation of sovereign exposures. Now, so what, what is the difference? So there are really two differences. One is um, we, we emphasize that this is good for the credibility of the no bailout clause, which is not something these previous reports emphasize. Um, and then we put sort of extra, we are super extra careful in desi designing, trying to design these risk sharing ar arrangements in a way that they do not uh, give rise uh, to moral hazard. So if you like, and this is also why we have gotten so much flack from our friends on the center left and, and left who previously thought we were in their camp, and in many ways we, we are in their camp, we have by, you know, making the, the difference, these two points, one and two, moved the whole thing a little bit in, in the direction of the Germanic spectrum, right? Because we, we justify it as a way of making the Nobel Art Clause um, a, a, a credible. Um, and that is entirely true, but precisely for this reason, we were under the impression that this could form the basis of a um, a, really a consensus within the euro area. So something that both the uh, countries that wanted these arrangements and the Germans uh, uh, could, could support. And you know, frankly, if you read our report, you m f should not fail to notice that it is essentially written as a didactical exercise uh, directed at the German public. Right? So our report is essentially educating the reader that risk sharing doesn't automatically mean bad incentives, right? That's how we meant it. And that is why it's, it sounds to some lefties of you kind of right wing. But we didn't have to convince you, we had to convince that particular side. Now, as it turns out, our hopes that we would, you know, magically now have a coalescence of the both sides was sorely disappointed. And you know, that's, that's life, but at least we got a little bit more. I mean, Meseberg is a little bit more than France and Germany have been doing in the, uh, in the past. Now, what I want uh, now to spend the rest of my time on is to describe two ways in which we were challenged, um, uh, which, are, which are a bit symmetrical. So one is a, a sort of a conservative challenge of the fiscal risk sharing idea and then uh, a challenge that has to do with our market discipline idea and I, I will spend little time on that. The first one partly was already covered, the second one actually uh, Guido is going to cover it in, in some uh, detail because he is our most eloquent uh, challenger um, out there but I, I just want to quickly uh, tell you how we would uh, respond to this. Okay, so, so the first challenge comes from this um, idea that fiscal risk sharing really might not be necessary. So if there are basically two lines of criticism against fiscal risk sharing. One is not even on this slide, but it is a little bit, um, you can see it a little bit from what Paul de Grave show, showed in the last panel. So the, the big you know, difference between the periphery countries and the core countries during the crisis is the amplitude of these, of these cycles, right? And so, you know, there is a school of thought saying that, you know, this amplitude is actually being produced by poor policies in the countries themselves, and so there's nothing to insure against, okay? Th that is the, the real problem is the output uh, declines, not so much how consumption reacts to the output. Uh, declines, and in fact, if consumption reacts a lot to the output declines because countries lose market access, this is all the fault of the countries themselves because they shouldn't have gotten themselves into a position where they were, would suffer this big output decline to begin with. They were punished for poor fundamentals and that's why they lost, um, uh, they lost market access. So this is a very extreme view, right? And so I'm not gonna dis discuss it here, but you know, my minimalistic response to this view is, is that even if you believe all these things, if I can give you an arrangement that is going to reduce the extent to which these output declines feed through to consumption, and I can do it for you in a way that doesn't create moral hazard, this is welfare improving, right? So even if you think that this is the bloody fault of you know, the periphery countries that they got themselves into a mess, at least I'm protecting their citizens 
from the uh, poor policies of their governments, and I'm also protecting the rest of the euro area because contagion, of course, will be lower because of aggregate demand externalities if uh, consumption is, is smaller. So that, uh, you know, that's the point. It's not on the slide, but there it is. But then there is, a, 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 I think, a more convincing and more, more, more stronger argument um, against fiscal risk sharing, and this is this point that maybe if we have good automatic stabilizers in all countries, and on the, you know, we work a little bit on private risk sharing, and maybe we reform the fiscal rules so that we both have fiscal space and sort of called rule space to do, let these automatic stabilizers work, maybe we don't need fiscal risk sharing at all. And, you know, typically the argument involves these decompositions that show the proportion of output shocks um, uh, um, uh, 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 smooth in the US and then in the periphery or the core countries. And so I've written down, I've shown you two of these decompositions. One is from a very nice paper by Cinzi Alcidi and, and co-authors here at, at SEPS. And you know, the main point to take away here, I don't know if this works. No, it doesn't work. No. Oh yes, it does. Is that, you know, when you look at these three periods, the core of, of Europe is always a lot better at risk sharing than the, the periphery. And then we have a very extreme case uh, here uh, where you know, there's almost no fusing in the periphery. The core is does sort of okay. But the other thing that's quite stunning is you know, during the great financial crisis when everyone agreed you know, after the London summit, we are really going to let these uh, fiscal stabilizers kick in. The core, according to her calculation, was more successful at risk sharing than even the US. U.S. states, right? And then we have another, a similar result by uh, Vittoria Milano, who actually claims that in the 2007 to 2014 period, the ability of the euro area core to smooth shocks was higher than in the U.S. on average over the entire period. And so the logic is very simple, which is let's just make sure that everyone is like the core, and then it will be fine, right? And so why could the core afford to do this because they were in a strong fiscal position, but also because they hadn't accumulated huge financial sector imbalances. And so the logic is, look, fiscal risk sharing fans, you should, you are looking at the wrong counterfactual, right? That's what these people are saying. The counterfactual is not what happened during the euro area crisis. The counterfactual is an alternative reform vision where we have fixed the banking union, we have fixed the fiscal rules. And in such a situation, there are there, the circumstances that would prevent uh, automatic stabilizers from, from working are no longer there. And that's what we should really target. So I think this is quite a powerful critique. And, and so, you know, I'm saying good points, but, you know, I still disagree with this view. So point number one is sort of the Paul de Grauwe um, point, which is that it, it it's just may not uh, may not work, right? So you may be, it's, it may be a little bit hard to, for everyone to become a core country. Uh, and so we need a belt and suspenders approach, and that means, yes, we should do banking union, we should do reform of the fiscal rules, but we should also introduce some uh, risk sharing. Now, the deeper, I think, point is the one that goes back to Emmanuel Faris's presentation earlier this afternoon, which is that even if we could achieve the same degree of consumption smoothing in the euro area as in the US without using fiscal risk sharing, it would be a less efficient way to do it because it doesn't exploit the welfare gains of diversification. And, and so the question then is, how big is these, are these welfare gains? And do, do they offset the possible agency costs or so the moral hazard of, welfare, uh, of, of these risk sharing arrangements? But here, this is where the logic of our proposal kings kicks in. In our view, a well-designed risk-sharing arrangement doesn't have any agency costs. It may have a little bit of agency costs if you look at it in isolation, but because it allows the Nobel outlook to be more credible, it also improves incentives. So then there's just no trade-off, right? You, you have better incentives and you have a welfare gain. And so even if the welfare gains are small, it's worth doing it. Moreover, the welfare gains actually are not small, like Emmanuel explained, because you know, the right comparison in his table is not the 65-55 comparison, it's the 85-55 comparison between a state of the world where you're doing only a fiscal uh, uh, stabilization on a national level and one where you're additionally doing uh, risk sharing. And you know, these tend to be these uh, 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 permanent um, you know, cr um, um, permanent shocks where, where these welfare gains are, uh, are, are large. And now, p p 
purely now if you if you also have this whole thing in the context of you know you're trying to make the Nobel clause credible it's clear uh, in my view that this is the quid pro quo for, for doing that right because you can only really uh, um, gain support for that if you are at the same time um, uh, telling countries, look, the risk that you're actually going to get a solvency shock that would require debt restructuring is, is low, and we will help you to prevent that. Okay, the, the second big critique is, uh, comes from, from Guido, uh, and so he will, he will explain this with many more slides, but the, the way I understand it, it boils down to two Points. So there, there are two things that could make life more difficult in this view, uh, particularly for the higher debt uh, countries. One is um, this concentration charge idea, the you know, regulation of sovereign exposures, the fact that we, don't, we want to reduce concentrated exposures uh, of uh, banks to their own sovereign, has the disadvantage that these banks can no longer act as a lender of last resort to their own governments in a, in a crisis, right? And this might, might make liquidity problems more acute. Um, and then there's this fundamental point that we really want to make um, the no bailout rule more enforceable. And, and so maybe this means that we may want to make debt restructuring more likely, which then would mean higher borrowing costs, hitting high debt countries disproportionately and making it more difficult for them to reduce their debts. So I think this is sort of the essence of what I understand to be the critique. And you know, again, I think these are very serious points, but I think they can be addressed. So on, on the first point, I think that if we want to break the doom loop, there's just no way around the conclusion that national banking system can no longer be lenders of last resort to their sovereigns, right? So you, have, you need to go one way uh, or the other. And in, in my view, uh, provided we have reliable sources of official liquidity support, it's fine to do this. And so here again, it comes down to the question, how much do we trust the OMT, right? But intellectually, the OMT is the answer to that problem. And on the second point, of course, you know, it's not actually true that we want to make debt restructurings more likely, right? We want to make debt restructurings more likely for countries that are deeply insolvent and cannot adjust, where we cannot get out of the problem using a plausible combination of fiscal adjustment, economic reforms, and external financing. For those, we want to make it uh, more likely because that's the best option we have uh, in that case. However, this is all conditional on the state of deep insolvency. And of course, our claim is by having all this risk share padding in our proposal, we're making that conditioning state less likely. And so the package as a whole need not, and we hope would not, raise uh, borrowing costs. Then, you know, there is the issue, is debt restructuring even feasible uh, in countries with very high debts without big disruptions? And the answer is, well, maybe you cannot reduce these disruptions very much, but it remains better than the counterfactual, right? The counterfactual is a Greek-style situation where you are simply pretending that the solvency problem not, does not exist in the sense that you think you can cure it in an adjustment program. But if there is a deep solvency problem, by definition, you cannot. And you end up with a situation where you're torturing the country, where you are producing a downward output spiral, and, in the, whole, and the whole thing blows up uh, into the face of the official sector. And then you get the complaints that uh, this is not what the Germans signed on to. Uh, and if we do this a few more times, the Eurozone will break up uh, for that reason. So let me get to my final point, which I call an open flank. And this is the question whether we really have done enough to make the euro irreversible, not just in a legal sense, but in an economic sense. And so to answer that question, I think what we should be looking at is sort of the potential situations that can lead to exit. So the first situation is the one I have just described. So if you have no debt restructuring option, and, and we, we get a few of these deep insolvencies. My, my view is that this will lead to exit either of the country, crisis country that is being tortured through a hopeless austerity program, or to the exit of a creditor country who realizes that this amounts to, in the end, to a fiscal transfer, right? So this is the type of situation that uh, arose in 2015 and that almost led to exit uh, by Greece. And this is not what uh, we, we should be having. And this is the point I think that we do address with our proposal. Okay, so we eliminate this specific threat, this path to exit. 
There is another one, which maybe is the most dangerous one, on which we have nothing to say in our proposal. And, you know, it, it, it just goes beyond stability issues. It goes deep into growth and institutional issues. And that is the possibility of a very protect, protracted stagnation inside the euro, which then triggers a voluntary exit. Now, the, the reason why I think this should not be a threat to the euro is because I do not believe that exchange rate regimes affect long-run growth. So in the long run, there's no reason why the euro should be keeping a, a country back. But clearly, you can have situations where countries just grow slow and slow and slow and slow, and they have accumulated imbalances. And you know, if you were an IMF mission chief, you would look at the country and you say, they need a devaluation. And you can't do this in the euro. And if the pressure you know, builds up too much, maybe they would want uh, to exit. So this is, in my view, the intractable problem. And then there's a third problem, which I think we have not thought about enough, and this is tractable, which is a situation where actually, unlike two, there is, no one wants the exit. So the government does not w really want to exit, but neither does it want to play by the rules of the safety net that's supposed to prevent the exit, which is some sort of ESM a conditionality. And so what then happens is what we almost saw in, in Greece. So there is, okay, let me, um, uh, this is my final slide. Um, so even though Euro members can never run out of reserves, right, because through the target system they have in, in effect unlimited balance of payment support and so you, you don't get these Krugman style speculative attacks, there is an analogous phenomenon in the Euro area which is they are forced to exit if the ECB stops supplying them with liquidity. And so in the Greek crisis, we were able to observe the circumstances in which the ECB would do that. It's not enough to simply go off track, not have a program or something like that, but you have to be kind of uninterested in even negotiating a program, right? If you do that, and you are outside a, the expiration of formal uh, program, you're beyond an expiration date, the ECB will cut you off uh, in the sense that it will uh, not raise the ELA ceiling anymore. And then basically you're faced with a choice, either you go back to the bargaining table or you, or you exit. And so the threat is that we could have something like this again if you have a very non-cooperative government. And so what I would you know, our urge everyone to think about is how we can keep banking systems supplied with liquidity in situations where these governments are non-cooperative. And so, you know, in my view, it would require some sort of, you know, seizing control of the banking system, continuing to supply ELA, letting the government do what it wants on the fiscal front, letting them go bankrupt if needed, but not actually make Euro membership conditional on fiscal good behavior. Um, and that we don't have right now. And on the other hand, we do have very strong institutions that can exercise control over the financial sector at the central level. And so I think something could be built on the existing institution to find something that would avoid that problem. Thank you. The next um, panelist is uh, Andres Apir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me first uh, extend my uh, thank you to the organizers for having me included in this uh, great, uh, great conference, uh, great, uh, great panel. Let me also dispel uh, fake news being spread by the National Bank of Belgium. Uh, I am not, uh, I've never been and will never be the president of the uh, University of Brussels, as it is indicated in the uh, distributed uh, documents. Now, this being said, so uh, let me move to our uh, topic. I will very much try to follow not only the discussion that uh, the previous speaker in this uh, session, in the previous one, uh, put forward, but also I think the, the introduction by uh, Herman van Rompuy. And uh, what Herman uh, said basically is that uh, we know what needs to be done. Um, the issue is about politics. 
And uh, I personally do think that uh, the problem that we are facing in the euro area uh, is, about, uh, is about politics. Uh, you will remember that uh, Tommaso Padoasquiopa had said that you know, the euro uh, is a currency without a state. Uh, I think that is not exactly the correct description uh, of the euro area. Uh, the euro area is a currency with many states, but states that have different views on certain matters, and uh, I think this is really what the crux uh, of the matter uh, is, uh, is all about. Now, uh, we all know that uh, the euro area suffered badly uh, from the crisis, and we know also what uh, the reasons were. Uh, the reason was that the original design did allow, uh, if not faster uh, to some extent, some huge uh, imbalances uh, after uh, 99. And when the crisis hit, uh, as Hermann van Rompuy said, you know, there was no, uh, no instrument uh, at the euro area level to deal with the financial crisis and with uh, the sovereign debt crisis. Everything had to be built from uh, scratch during uh, those three uh, years from 2010 to 2012. Now, clearly, uh, the current design, EMU 2.0, uh, is a great improvement uh, on the previous one, but uh, major imbalances do remain. And the mechanism that we have, be it the ESM, be it the uh, OMT, be it the banking union, they are all uh, insufficient. And I think that was, again, the, the message of uh, Herman van Rompuy. Uh, we are not ready, uh, let's face it, we are not ready to uh, deal with uh, another uh, crisis of the type uh, we had. Now, there have been various proposals on, on the table. We have heard already uh, twice uh, this afternoon the 7 plus 7 uh, proposal, which uh, is certainly a, a very uh, important proposal. There have been other uh, proposals, and I, I will say a word about those, uh, those proposals. But my view is that, indeed, uh, it's not just about uh, economic governance in the end. Uh, it's also uh, about political uh, governance, uh, the political and politics, and uh, politics at the national level, and uh, politics at the uh, euro uh, area level. Now, what was wrong with the original design uh, of uh, EMU is that, as I already said, it was uh, badly prepared uh, to deal with a financial crisis. Uh, basically, we had only uh, national uh, instruments uh, for uh, the surveillance, for the management, and for the resolution of, uh, of financial, uh, in particular banking uh, crisis, and uh, we, re we were really totally unprepared, including intellectually, uh, with the uh, possibility of uh, sovereign debt crisis. So that certainly was not a, a very, very uh, pretty, uh, pretty picture. Now, uh, how should uh, EMU deal uh, with uh, or address uh, financial crisis? Uh, I think uh, now we uh, very much uh, understand that uh, EMU does need uh, what we call the banking union, that is common mechanism for supervision, for uh, resolution and for deposit uh, insurance guarantee uh, for banks, but we also need uh, to rely less uh, on bank uh, lending. Uh, that has already been emphasized uh, this afternoon many, many times, but I do think that this is indeed uh, a, real, uh, a real issue. There's too much bank uh, debt out there. Clearly, uh, as already indicated, the, uh, the reform that were undertaken uh, since 2009, uh, they do provide a, a partial answer, but I think there was also very much agreement on, on all the speakers that needs, more needs to be done. Uh, and what more needs to be done? Completing uh, the banking union. I do think that it would be logical that uh, the land of last resort uh, facility, uh, which is now at the level of the National Central Bank, move to uh, the European Central Bank. That would be the logical uh, consequences, uh, consequence of uh, having 
the banking uh, the banking union and uh, we do need uh, to reduce uh, bank dependence that is indeed uh, the discussion about uh, capital markets uh, union uh, now what about uh, sovereign uh, debt crisis uh, clearly there is too much uh, national uh, sovereign debt uh, out there. Uh, that was, I think, a problem. Uh, we entered into a monetary union in 99 uh, with a number of countries, including this one and including Italy, with very high uh, levels uh, of debt. And uh, I think we should have made, during the good years, uh, more effort uh, to reduce the, uh, the, debt, uh, the debt level, to have more fiscal space. And uh, certainly when the, the banking crisis uh, came, and we know that you know, typically a banking crisis in uh, industrialized countries, they increase the uh, debt, public debt to GDP ratio by about 30 points uh, of GDP. That's sort of more or less the norm uh, across OECD countries. In some it was a bit more, in some it was about a bit less. It means that you do need to have the fiscal space, and some countries simply did not have the, the, the fiscal space, and that was uh, a problem. So reducing uh, national debt, uh, I think, is an, is an important element, and to have fiscal rules to, to encourage that, that that's important. Uh, to reduce the exposure of banks to national sovereign debt, I think, is also uh, a good, uh, a good uh, idea. Uh, my sense is that uh, yeah, the fiscal rules, uh, they were, and I think they are still pretty much uh, deficient. Uh, they don't put enough emphasis on, on debt, uh, on debt sustainability, and certainly one needs uh, better uh, enforcement uh, of those rules. But I think that indeed when a crisis and a sovereign debt crisis occurs, and they will continue to, uh, to occur, uh, one does need to increase the ability of the instruments that we have the ESM and the uh, ECB's OMT to deal uh, with uh, those uh, crises. So I think that indeed, uh, you know, the, the, the term that has been used the most this afternoon, which is risk, is indeed uh, the crux uh, of the matter. Uh, to uh, deal uh, with risk, to uh, have the, uh, you know, that, this at, at, at the center of our, of our discussion. Now, in the uh, Franco-German 7 plus 7 uh, contribution, uh, the debate is indeed put on, you know, the emphasis on the debate is indeed on uh, finding uh, a way to proceed with both uh, risk sharing and uh, risk reduction. Uh, that has been the, uh, the narrative of the, of the proposal and other proposal in this direction. I, I basically share uh, that view. However, uh, I also do share uh, elements coming from a number of Italian or uh, Spanish uh, contribution that put the emphasis instead of you know, risk sharing and risk reduction on the notion of risk of redenomination. And this was about the Grexit, this was about uh, the risk uh, that uh, Italy uh, faced. And it seems to me that uh, the, the, the matter of risk of re the redenomination risk is indeed uh, a very, very important one. I mean, this is what is, in the end, putting the, the, Euro, uh, the Euro project uh, at risk. So my sense is that uh, the two approaches here are correct. Uh, one has to look at the objective, and I think this is what you, you said basically at the end in your last uh, slide. One has to, div to, to create a system uh, that will eliminate, or if not eliminate, reduce drastically uh, the redenomination risk. And in order to do that, uh, I do think that indeed the correct instrument uh, to do that is to have a combination of risk sharing and uh, risk reduction. But as we will see, uh, this, is highly, uh, this is highly political. This is not just about economic governance, this is about uh, political uh, governance. Now, the risk of redenomination, uh, I think in, 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 uh, in countries, 
uh, when you look, you know, a country that is facing a risk of redenomination, uh, I think the origin of that risk can be both domestic and can be foreign. And again, you, uh, Yeromin, in, in your presentation, you, you spoke about contagion. And that's certainly an issue that, you know, we need to deal with at the euro area level. Uh, I'm sort of a bystander here. Uh, you know, uh, suddenly there is something happening in Greece, and I'm facing also uh, spread, the contagion. And I'm being affected by this. Uh, but in some cases, uh, the origin of the redenomination risk that I'm facing can be also domestic. Uh, can be political risk, can be fiscal risk, even though the fiscal risk itself may be partly linked to a, a banking crisis, sort of because I did not have sufficient uh, fiscal space. So it seems to me that one needs to address this both with euro area level instruments and uh, national. Now, let me illustrate this with uh, the case of Belgium and, and Italy. Now, why Belgium and Italy? Because Belgium and Italy are two countries that did enter the euro in 99 with extremely high uh, levels uh, of public debt, uh, well above uh, the 60%, um, well above 100%. And uh, what we saw during the, the, the crisis is that the behavior uh, of the sovereign risk in Italy and in Belgium was uh, very, very different. Let me, let me show you uh, a couple of figures here. Now, the top figure shows the 10-year uh, yields uh, for Italy, uh, for Italian bonds, and for uh, Belgian bonds, uh, Belgium in blue and Italy in red, uh, from the 1st of January 99 up to the spring uh, of, uh, of this year. The bottom line there shows the spread, not the usual spread that one shows vis-a-vis -vis Germany. This is the spread between Italy and Belgium. Now, remember that the two countries did enter uh, the euro area with very, very high uh, debt level. And by the way, in 2007, on the eve of the crisis, the, the level of debt was still pretty high in, in the two countries. It was uh, around 85% in Belgium. It was about 100% in, in Italy. They were not that different. Okay? And you see that up to 2010, let's say up to May 2010, the Greek crisis, the uh, spread uh, was in favor of Italy. The yield on Italian bonds was slightly lower, 50 basis point lower in Italy than in Belgium, presumably owing to the fact that the, the Italian uh, market uh, is bigger than, than the Belgian market. So it's Belgium that was pre paying a sort of a risk premium compared to, uh, to Italy. And then uh, the, Itali the, the Greek crisis starts in, in May 2010. There is contagion. And both Belgium and Italy are affected in similar manner. And you see that the yields uh, in Belgium and in Italy at the top level, they start to increase a bit. And if you look at the bottom level, uh, you see that the spread between Italy and Belgium uh, does not increase much during that, uh, that, that period. They increased a little bit, but not, bit, not much. Where the Italian spread really start to increase and the, uh, over the, the, the Belgian uh, uh, debt is from July 2011. And you see sort of the, 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 the spike uh, on the bottom chart going from July 2011 up to July 2012. Now, we know what July 2012 is, the, the, the announcement by, uh, by Mario Draghi. Now, what is July 2011 here? Uh, July 2011, in my reading, uh, maybe Guido will have a, a different view, is the start of the political crisis in Italy. And uh, that will end uh, in November 2011 with Mr. Berlusconi. Uh, leaving uh, the scene. You remember that in the summer also Mario Draghi and uh, Jean-Claude Tichet write a letter to, uh, to uh, uh, the, the Prime Minister of Italy telling him to put order in uh, the affairs of, of, uh, of Italy. And now there is the announcement in July, uh, the spreads come down, but you see that Italy never goes back to the situation it was uh, before. Uh, on average, no. Since uh, July 2012, the, uh, the spread 
of Italy over, over Belgium is about 37 points, while before the, the, the Greek crisis, it was 50 basis points in favor of Belgium, so nearly 100 points. So we are clearly in a, in a new regime, and you see that they've been, obviously, with the political situation recently, different spikes. Now, the lesson that I draw from this is that, sure, the uh, European Central Bank, and with its announcement and the OMT announcement, had a huge role to play in calming down the markets. But it could not solve the an entire problem. So yes, the ECB alone could mitigate, but it could not eliminate, in my view, entirely the redenomination risk, as we are observing uh, today with the, uh, the politics in Italy. So I think there were important differences between Belgium and, and Italy uh, that explain, apart from the politics in July 2011, that explain why markets uh, were defined vis-a-vis -vis Italy. Uh, and it's the fact that uh, the debt-to-GDP ratio uh, in Belgium and Italy had evolved very, very differently uh, after the two countries joined uh, the euro. There was much more decline in Belgium. And there is also the fact that the NPLs in Italy, you know, now we talk about the NPLs in Italy and how high uh, they were, but look how high they were already in 2007. So before the start of the crisis, NPL level were already at 5.8%. Well, you say, what is 5.8% compared to the kind of numbers that we have today? But for 2007, it was extremely high. Belgium, throughout the crisis, never got to 5.8%, never got above 4.2%. So in Italy, uh, I think the management of the, of the debt, but also the management of the uh, banking problems was really uh, uh, not uh, as it should, have, uh, it should have been. So I come to the fact that, yes, uh, the, um, the, the ECB and the ESM, they are our uh, crisis management uh, instrument. And yes, uh, they can and they should play a more, uh, a more important role role. Uh, and I think there is a, there is a logic in, indeed, as was said in, already in, in, in the previous session, that indeed the ECB uh, should be the provider uh, of liquidity both to, uh, to in case of banking crisis and in the case uh, of uh, sovereign crisis. But we also need an institution that is the ESM, which is sort of the, the, fiscal, uh, the fiscal backstop. Uh, to the system, and uh, I think that indeed one should conceive, you know, one usually thinks of the ESM as the instrument to deal with sovereign, sovereign debt crisis. Uh, I think what, that one should see the ESM as the instrument, as, as the fiscal backstop for both the sovereign debt crisis and the banking crisis. After all, uh, if, one thing, if there is one thing that we have learned from, uh, from the euro area crisis, is that you can't separate the banking crisis and, uh, and the sovereign debt crisis. There are two sides uh, of the same thing. And therefore, it's very important that the ECB, uh, in its uh, acting as you know, provision of liquidity, and the ECB is very, very well equipped to do that, thinks of both the banking system and uh, the sovereigns and it has the, the instrument to do that, I think the ESM uh, needs to be in the same frame of mind, thinking of the, the sovereign crisis and the banking crisis as being two facets of uh, similar crisis, and uh, I think that's, that's the way it should be. Now, I think the ESM does have uh, the current ESM, and I think that's why I think the proposals for a European monetary fund, I think, were well-deserved, uh, I think the ESM, as we know, uh, does face a number of governance uh, problems, be it the unanimity, uh, the issue of approval by, uh, by national parliaments. But there, the difficulty to change those matters is you know, national, uh, national politics. And in the end, it seems to me that you know, the governance, one should not waste too much time about arguing about reforming the governance of the ESM and moving to, to the EMF, I think what we should really care is that the ESM is able to act in a preemptive manner, in a precautionary manner, not uh, as it has uh, in the past, uh, function in an ultima ratio uh, logic, that is to act when you are really uh, ready to fall off uh, the cliff. I think we need a system which is a more 
preventive uh, system, a more precautionary system, uh, rather than a system that solves the problem when uh, you are really uh, risking to have a, a major collapse, because this is indeed where the redenomination risk uh, comes about. Um, now, um, let me let me just uh, let me just add uh, a couple of points, and then I will uh, I will wrap up. Um, now, I think giving the uh, ECB and the ESM or EMF uh, a greater role in uh, in crisis management, which essentially means great, greater risk sharing, is by definition highly political, and it's highly political in the economic sense of highly political because it has potentially redistributive uh, elements. That's what I call here political, the fact that uh, it may have redistribution effect, uh, and not just redistribution effect across different groups of citizens, as we spoke about from monetary policy, but uh, across, uh, across different, uh, across different uh, countries. And I think to, 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 to be able to, uh, to have this more political, more risk-sharing uh, function, uh, I think what, uh, what is lacking at the moment uh, is sufficient trust, sufficient trust between countries and sufficient trust uh, towards the, towards the, the ESM. Uh, I personally would like very much the ESM to be embedded more into a political system. Uh, to be an instrument of a euro area uh, fiscal uh, authority. Now you would say, well, today uh, the ESM is the instrument of the, uh, of the Eurogroup. But the Eurogroup is not exactly uh, a politically accountable uh, body. And I think that is really uh, a difficulty. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I'm in favor of having a more institutional element, uh, a euro area fiscal authority, a EMF, and they being accountable. Uh, without them being accountable, I think we will have uh, political, uh, political problems. So one can discuss different formula for political accountability, but I think this is very, very important. Now, the trust between countries uh, is equally important. It's not just trust towards the ESM, it's trust uh, between, uh, between countries. Now, greater risk sharing and risk reduction to eliminate the risk of redenomination do require greater trust uh, between countries, and greater trust requires less heterogeneity, more convergence uh, on certain dimensions. And what we observe is that the quality of governance uh, across uh, euro area countries is very, very big. I've put here uh, one indicator, the, the typical indicator, World Bank Governance Indicator, that has different uh, component, uh, voice accountability, political stability, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, uh, rule of law, uh, control of corruption. Uh, this is for the Euro area uh, countries. And uh, you see the, the huge differences between Finland, which performs the best, and Greece, that performs the least well uh, at the uh, very, very top. This kind of heterogeneity uh, is, uh, is really uh, problematic uh, in order to, to move uh, forward. Uh, you can look at other indicators, quality of governance. Uh, this is by region. It tells more or less uh, the same story. There's huge uh, differences across countries in the uh, quality uh, of governance. So to do risk sharing and to have more trust, uh, which it requires, uh, with this kind of situation, I think is problematic. Now, let me make a proposal and uh, conclude. Uh, I think on, on this discussion of risk sharing and risk reduction, I see two potential uh, options. One option is that uh, we cannot do more risk sharing as long as there is no more risk reduction. In other words, first you need greater convergence uh, between countries, and only when you will have achieved greater convergence, we will be able to uh, accept uh, more risk sharing. There is the opposite view that, you know, yes, there is this, this uh, heterogeneity, and uh, this heterogeneity may be itself a source of, of the risk, but the risk is, uh, could lead to redenomination risk. You, you don't want to have that. Therefore, you should move ahead with uh, risk sharing for all the countries, including those uh, that uh, are very, very different. And the proposal that I would like to put forward is a, is a third option. And the third option is to move ahead with greater risk sharing, but only among countries with sufficiently low risk. I'm not saying that we should not do what we do already today. 
Okay? I'm not wanting to backtrack on the ESM as it works today. But what I want is to have the ESM being able to act in a more precautionary, in a more preventive, preemptive uh, manner to avoid uh, the risk of uh, uh, that, that, that can, uh, the risk of, of contagion, uh, for instance. And I think here one could incentivize countries to do the reform that are necessary to reduce risk, because if they do reduce the risk, then they will qualify automatically for this precautionary element. So I'm trying to move away from the logic of uh, ultima ratio, that the ESM can only be used in a crisis to, be, to have an ESM and an OMT act in a preventive manner. But for that, you need to pre-qualify. And only some countries, I think, today would pre-qualify. But the other countries would need to be helped in order to converge and to be able to pre-qualify in the future. Thank you. So, Guido, our next uh, panelist, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this interesting conference. I say, must say that uh, whenever I talk about Eurozone reforms, I always feel like I'm uh, the kid from the bad uh, family in the neighborhood, <laughs> <laughs> particularly these days, and this makes me uncomfortable, but I, I'll try to overcome <laughs> the discomfort and, and push for my ideas. Uh, so what uh, I want to, to do is to very briefly review uh, uh, why was uh, the last financial crisis so bad and then spend more time on uh, uh, what to do uh, along the lines of the previous speakers. So very quickly, uh, why was the last crisis so bad? Well, uh, we know that uh, prevention failed, uh, particularly with regard to current account deficits, but also with the high legacy debts. We know that um, there were amplifying mechanisms uh, at work, both the bank sovereign dupe loop and uh, the redenomination risk, uh, as well as the political reactions in some countries. According to some, because uh, uh, we had uh, not enough debt restructuring and, and maybe not enough uh, market discipline, uh, and then uh, we lacked, as has been emphasized uh, repeatedly, we lack the tools to manage the financial crisis. Uh, there was no fiscal tool for managing a sudden stop, no, no ESM yet. Monetary policy was unprepared also to deal with a sudden stop. It was also unprepared to cope with the uh, zero lower bound on interest rate. As a result, QE was late to come. Uh, fiscal policy could not operate. We have no Eurozone fiscal policy. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the lessons of the financial crisis is that fiscal policy is particularly needed when you are at uh, uh, zero lower bound for interest, rate, interest rates. And then, of course, we had no tools for, uh, uh, for uh, 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 public risk sharing. Now, so let me take these points in turn, starting with uh, the first one, uh, the initial conditions. And, and this is really perhaps the main point that I want to make. Uh, I think one of uh, the lessons that maybe we have learned uh, is that uh, maybe we should not have let into the Eurozone countries that were unprepared. And we, maybe we were too lenient in allowing them to be uh, in the Eurozone. Uh, and, uh, uh, I think uh, the main message that Jeromeen and others in the 7 plus 7 report pushed is to seek a compromise between more risk sharing and more market discipline. I think that the message of my, uh, of my talk instead is that uh, this is a dangerous compromise and the compromise we should seek is between more risk sharing and more debt reduction because the legacy debts are so high that uh, it's uh, difficult to have trust and it's difficult to have meaningful market discipline uh, in, uh, uh, in these uh, circumstances. Uh, so I think that the main issue is the legacy debt have become worse. They were high, uh, but they become much worse. 
uh, market discipline, as we have seen from uh, the pictures that Andere showed, uh, arrives too late, and then when it arrives, it may fail to discriminate. Uh, and uh, I think we should not forget that institutional constraints, although defective, have had a bite uh, with regard to European fiscal policy. You see here the numbers, the deficit in the Eurozone as a, as a whole are much lower uh, now than in uh, other advanced countries. Uh, and uh, with the exception of Italy, the debt to GDP has come down. So I think um, fiscal constraints do matter. Uh, I think the fiscal compact uh, is ineffective, nevertheless. The European Fiscal Board has made very clear why in its statements. The Commission was probably too lenient in the last few years. The rules are too complex. And, and the most important point, I think, that we are seeing now with Italy is that sanctions uh, are not effective and enforcement is, is lacking. So I think the priority, in my view, should be not to focus so much on uh, uh, making market discipline work in general, but on strengthening the fiscal rules with the help of fiscal discipline. Uh, and uh, here, I think the 7 plus 7 report and the European Fiscal Board have a number of uh, uh, important and useful suggestions that somehow have been de-emphasized in the ongoing debate, and I think this is a pity. Uh, in particular, so I think focusing on that uh, should be the priority. The operational target that uh, the 7 plus 7 and the European Fiscal Board emphasize of a primary net expenditure rule on, on growth uh, rule uh, should, should be um, uh, reconsidered. But the, perhaps the most important issue is how to make these uh, constraints more effective. Uh, and uh, I think it's here that maybe we should exploit uh, market discipline, uh, forcing, of course, this would be requiring a change in the, in the fiscal compact, but forcing uh, the countries in violation of uh, the debt rules to issue debt which is junior relative to the outstanding debt. Uh, and junior would be more costly with larger haircuts from the ECB. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, this would focus market discipline on this new, on this new debt, but uh, 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 hoping that contagion would not be an issue, mainly on the new debt. Uh, also, uh, I think it's logical to imagine that countries in violation would be excluded from the risk sharing mechanism. And here, I, if I may take an issue with Andre, I did not understand whether you meant this last bullet point or that uh, uh, even countries with bad initial conditions but who comply with the uh, uh, fiscal rules uh, ought to be excluded from risk sharing. I think in this case, this would be dangerous. It would, of course, push countries out of, uh, of the Eurozone. Uh, let me take the second point then, uh, namely the amplifying mechanism and the bank, in particular the bank sovereign doom, doom loop. Let me remind you, uh, here too, of course, things have got uh, much worse. This is uh, the percentage of uh, uh, bank holdings of domestic uh, sovereign bonds as percent of uh, the bank assets. And as you see, when the crisis started in 2008, things were not so bad after all. Countries had uh, four, five percentage of their assets in domestic bonds. <coughs> Nevertheless, the doom loop was at work. Uh, since then, we know that things have gotten much worse in Southern Europe in particular, where now uh, domestic holdings uh, of bonds are 10, 11% of domestic assets. But, focus on the initial position. The initial position was much lower, and yet the doom loop was, uh, was relevant. Why was uh, this accumulation of uh, domestic holdings of, uh, uh, of bonds? Well, uh, a sudden stop meant that the core countries unloaded that public debt from uh, the peripheries. Somebody bought it, and who bought it were the domestic ban banks of uh, these uh, uh, periphery countries. So I think there is no doubt that during this crisis, this uh, increase in the, domestic, in, this, in the home bias uh, was a stabilizing force uh, that reduced uh, the magnitude of the crisis. Now, the question, there are two questions here, I think. One question is, 
can we break the amplification mechanism by uh, re forcing a reduction in the holdings of domestic, uh, of, of domestic banks of, uh, of the national bonds? And I think uh, we, we, are, we don't know. Honestly, we don't know, and there are good arguments for thinking that uh, the mechanism at work would remain very relevant, particularly today. The redenomination risk would remain. One way to reduce the redenomination risk, of course, would be to have faster political integration in other domains. The euro was a political project to begin with, uh, and I think the way to reduce the redenomination risk is to uh, uh, continue on the path of political integration because then countries would see that much more is at stake. And the idea of doing this through financial engineering, I think, is, uh, is, is, is dangerous. Second, as we are seeing now in Italy, people are not only afraid of redenomination risk in the event of debt restructuring, they understand that debt restructuring would be accompanied by a capital levy, by a wealth tax, and so capital is flying out of the country. Uh, of course, there are general equilibrium effects. A recession would lead to uh, a lot of non-performing loans. This is one of the important reasons why NPL rose so much in Italy rather than Belgium, because the, uh, the recession was uh, much more severe. Uh, and we know from uh, financial data that uh, sovereign rating is typically a ceiling for corporate rating. So I am doubtful that you can break uh, so easily the, uh, the doom loop. Uh, and second, as I just argued, so there are two issues here with regard to sovereign concentration charges. One is how large would be the benefits of these charges? Possibly they would be small. There is evidence, that the, I think the evidence here is mixed. There are papers, I know that there are papers who, who find the opposite, but this is a, an example, this paper by Boton di Adaldi, of, of, Edal, uh, of a very careful paper that during the period between uh, November 2011 and uh, uh, six months later, uh, found, uh, uh, sorry, June 2011 and, uh, and six months later, found no evidence that uh, uh, banks with uh, more holdings of domestic uh, bonds in their portfolio had a smaller growth of credit. Uh, what was important was the nationality of the bank. It was not the portfolio composition of the asset. So possibly the benefit of these concentration charges would be small, uh, and arguably the cost of the concentration charges could be high, uh, because of the stabilizing feature that I just described. Notice that it would be wrong to only argue that uh, uh, the reason why Italian and periphery banks uh, bought domestic bonds was uh, uh, moral suasion. I think there are good corporate finance reasons. They operate under limited liability. If the sovereign goes bust, probably the bank would not survive, uh, and hence they value sovereign risk during a crisis differently from foreign banks. Uh, and so this uh, may imply that the fire sale in the event of, uh, uh, of a crisis are going to be less pronounced. Um, I think I fully buy into the idea that it would be better if uh, in good times uh, uh, domestic banks uh, were reducing their holdings of domestic portfolios. The issue is what happens during a crisis. Maybe there is a way to allow the safety valve to operate by waiving the concentration charges uh, during bad times. Uh, uh, one other point uh, uh, that uh, uh, people blame on uh, the severity of the crisis was uh, the lack of a debt restructuring mechanism. Uh, and here too, I, I'm not convinced, but let me explain uh, why. So there are two purposes f uh, that are uh, typically argued uh, in favor of uh, uh, a European debt restructuring mechanism and, and different rules for debt restructuring. One is the, uh, the goal that uh, you should reduce the cost of debt restructuring, making it more orderly. And the second is that there is a time inconsistency at work. In equilibrium, because of the, time in, because of the cost of debt restructuring, debt restructuring comes too late, uh, even if debt is unsustainable. 
uh, this weakens uh, the discipline of the market. There is too much lending. Uh, and so to remedy this, we should logically make debt restructuring more likely, as uh, Jeremy clarified, when debt is unsustainable. Now, unfortunately, it's not so easy to assess when debt is unsustainable, and so a logical implication is that debt restructuring would become more likely also in countries with the high legacy debts. And of course, this, uh, because there are many reasons why that may be unsustainable. This also makes a debt run more likely and it makes it more costly to live with a high public debt. So my reaction to this idea is make your debt more easy to restructure, but be very careful to make my high public debt easier to restructure. The second uh, 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 goal of uh, uh, this discussion is to make debt restructuring less costly, more orderly. Frankly, I think it is almost a joke to think that debt restructuring is orderly when you have these high percentages of debt to GDP. And the lessons that we observe are not really very informative. There is no experience of uh, major debt restructuring outside of Greece of an advanced country. Typically, developing countries have high uh, percentages of external debts. Uh, and so it is, it is uh, difficult to know how costly debt restructuring would be. Uh, also, uh, a very important difference between the Eurozone and uh, developing countries is that domestic, the debt in the Eurozone is issued under national law. Uh, whereas under developing countries it's issued under external foreign law. So th for the IMF, the debate on debt restructuring takes a much more relevant dimension. And in fact, if you looked at what happened when you introduced collective action clauses, they made the cost of uh, servicing the debt lower for the debt which is covered by the collection action clauses relative to the previous debt. So if anything, the collective action clauses clarified some contingencies and uh, made less restructuring uh, more costly or less likely. Um, and I think an international court typically exposed would protect the creditors more than the debtors. So if we were, I have nothing against the single limb clause, I don't think it would make such a big difference, but if we were serious about reducing the cost of debt restructuring, maybe we should remove the collective action clauses and increase the ambiguity that would allow national law to change the terms of the contract. Now, of course, uh, more costly debt, uh, uh, debt restructuring is both good, good and bad. Exposed it is bad. Exante, uh, having higher cost may be, may be better because it reduces the, uh, the likelihood of, uh, uh, of a bad event. Um, also, Greece is often mentioned as an instance of uh, a situation in which debt restructuring came too late. I am not a participant, of course, in, in those negotiations. I'm a, an external observer, not very attentive. But I wonder whether the reason why debt restructuring, or one possibility, why debt restructuring came so late in Greece, uh, is not because uh, uh, debt restructuring would have been very costly for Greece. It's because you wanted to protect the French and the German banks, and that allowed this to happen. And then, uh, the debt became official and it became costly politically in Germany and in other creditor countries to uh, engage in debt restructuring for Greece. So the cost of debt restructuring for the debtor country, in my opinion, in Greece uh, is not obvious that can be blamed on, uh, uh, on the delay uh, and on the small amount of restructuring that we have seen. Um, nevertheless, there is one important idea uh, that uh, uh, should not be forgotten and should be emphasized on the debate on debt restructuring. And that is the idea that we may benefit from having a seniority structure on sovereign debt, and we do not have it now. Uh, there is here an obvious analogy with the, uh, the large uh, systemic uh, financial institutions uh, that are forced to issue equity-like equity instruments in order to achieve a debt reduction during a crisis. And of course, that's uh, uh, very helpful. Uh, but notice that uh, to achieve this, you need to have some mechanism of external enforcement. And this is perhaps where supranational institutions like the Eurozone may help. Uh, and this brings me back to the idea 
that I mentioned earlier, uh, namely we should uh, think seriously about uh, uh, forcing countries that are in violation of uh, fiscal rules to issue junior debt. Uh, this would increase their discipline and would also focus market discipline on, uh, uh, on the new debt. And Lorenzo Binismaghi has an interesting idea uh, of uh, uh, distinguishing between purple bonds that would be senior uh, and protected from ESM restructuring. These are the bonds that are consistent with the uh, reduction uh, of debt along the trajectory uh, that is uh, predicted by the debt rules uh, and the junior bonds that would not be protected. Uh, another idea that I think is worth exploring is also to think about uh, implicit juniority through indexation to the level of uh, nominal GDP. Um, let me then turn quickly to uh, uh, the tools for managing the sudden stop, uh, and in particular uh, to uh, uh, the ESM. So of course, since, uh, uh, since the crisis, we have the ESM, which is a tool, fiscal tool to manage a sudden stop. Um, the debate on the ESM concerns the role that the ESM should have on uh, assessing debt sustainability uh, and its governance. Uh, now, I think it's not in dispute that the ESM should only lend if debt is sustainable. This is already the status quo, should not, should, it's not under discussion, should not be changed. The question is should, who should be in charge of this assessment and how proactive should the ESM be in this assessment. Uh, now, uh, as I said before, assessing debt sustainability is uh, typically very difficult because uh, uh, you have a situation of weak fundamentals and liquidity crisis. Uh, so there are possibilities of making mistakes in both directions. And uh, as, I, as I argued before, one should be wary of uh, having a very proactive role of uh, 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 the ESM in assessing that sustainability. But there is also a governance issue, which I think it's important to stress. Uh, it's a political issue, but I think we should not shy away from, from discussing it. Uh, the ESM is an intergovernment body. Uh, and obviously, it uh, uh, represents, in a crisis situation, the interest of the creditor countries that are, that are stronger. So uh, I think it would be much easier to accept the idea that uh, the SM should have a more proactive role in assessing that sustainability if it was uh, a European institution accountable to the European Parliament rather than to national parliament. Under the current governance situation in which it is an intergovernmental body, the uh, obvious danger is, uh, given the importance of, uh, of uh, the institution and of, of the issue, the obvious danger is that uh, uh, some countries may interpret the role, a more proactive role of the SM uh, to uh, be motivated by other interests of the creditor countries. And if that was the case, of course, the whole institution would lose legitimacy. So it is in the interest of the ESM uh, if you want a more proactive role to think seriously about uh, uh, a different governance system for the ESM. Uh, on uh, monetary policy, uh, let me just uh, uh, say two things. Uh, the first, we already, of course, we have the OMT. It's not obvious at all to me why OMT should be conditional on an ESM program. Suppose that Italy were to be in a financial crisis again soon, maybe exit the euro. Why should Portugal go through an ESM program to be uh, prevented from contagion? There is no logical reason. The ECB should intervene on a liquidity crisis. It's an independent institution. It has a clear mandate. There is no reason logical reason to also subject uh, the intervention of the ECB to an ESM program. Second, and this is not political, the ECB could change this anytime it wants, uh, one lesson of the crisis that we learned is that there is a risk of being at the interest rate uh, lower bound. This risk is much higher than we thought, and uh, it is particularly high given that we have a framework for monetary policy that is uh, asymmetric with uh, lower deviations from the implicit 2% goal that is uh, 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 favored over uh, higher 
goal. So there is no reason for this asymmetry. Maybe other frameworks like price level targeting rather than inflation targeting uh, would uh, uh, remove the danger of being at the zero lower bound. On fiscal policy, uh, uh, we still have no uh, fiscal capacity. I think here the main goal of uh, fiscal capacity for the Eurozone, in my opinion, should be to have uh, the ability to sustain aggregate demand when you are at the zero lower bound for interest rates uh, and to cope with large asymmetric shocks. There are two tools to cope with that. The primary tool, of course, would be to have the possibility to issue euro bonds. Uh, this would be a game changer, but of course uh, it, uh, it is not politically feasible. The second tool, which is advocated in, in many current discussions, is to have rainy day funds of different magnitudes. Uh, this is a step forward, but nevertheless, uh, we should be aware that there are inefficiencies and uh, smaller benefits. Inefficiencies because uh, we need to reduce these legacy debts and the rainy day funds would be accumulating assets, so it would become more costly to reduce the debts. Uh, and of course, the resources that can be mobilized in the event of a crisis are going to be uh, smaller. So the benefit of, uh, of the insurance here is going to be smaller. And finally, uh, on public risk sharing, I think this is uh, uh, um, uh, much discussed. Let me emphasize just two points. On the European deposit insurance, uh, it's obvious that uh, the benefits and the costs are, uh, and the risks are asymmetric. The question is how do you want to address this asymmetry? And in my view, rather than forcing a diversification of bank portfolio that may bank backfire for all, we should think harder about having diversified charges not based on the portfolios of the individual banks, but based on aggregate uh, national debts. On European unemployment insurance, uh, of course, it's difficult to calibrate so that it is really an insurance mechanism. I think we should emphasize as economists uh, uh, the fact that uh, it may be symbolically and politically important to have disbursements directly to individual. A reinsurance mechanism may be more efficient, make more sense uh, from a technical point of view, but one of the purposes uh, of this uh, mechanism is really to change uh, what the European, zone, uh, Euro, uh, European Union stands for, and this uh, has to be done through direct disbursements to individuals. So summarizing, uh, I think the key problem that uh, we have is that of high legacy debts and economic divergence. We should not pretend that we can solve this problem with financial engineering. Uh, we should not be pretending that we know what we do not know. The risks that we expose to ourselves with financial engineering uh, can be great. It can, uh, in the name of risk reduction, we could destabilize the system. And so uh, I think we should avoid uh, um, doing that and we should instead think much harder about external constraints on, on fiscal policy uh, and uh, get started with the limited uh, uh, fiscal capacity and risk sharing that, that may be politically feasible. Thank you. Now we have our first uh, discussion, Mr. Vito Constantio, please. Well, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me. Um, we had uh, three uh, excellent presentations. Let me make three general comments. The first one is to highlight that all the speakers spoke from the perspective of general uh, measures to strengthen the euro area not about the next crisis, which was the title of our panel. Uh, is it fit to address the next crisis? This is important because what they said, if it is not implemented, then what happens in the next crisis? So we have to reflect from this other perspective. Second point, there was a lot of consensus and three points of uh, divergence about uh, how to deal with the doom loop, uh, concentration charges or not, uh, the debt restructuring and the nature of the ESM and if it should be enhanced in its powers. 
Those are the three that I will try to address in my time. The third point I wanted to make was that Thinking from a general perspective of the strengthening of the euro area, there was not enough emphasis on one of the crucial problems of a monetary union among different countries, which is the inherent fragility of national debt markets. Uh, and this happens, we know very well, from uh, what uh, Charles Goodhart has written and Paul de Grove on this inherent fragility. Um, this is uh, important because it means that any crisis can trigger liquidity squeezes, sudden stops, uh, speculative attacks and contagion uh, uh, that would require a response being of that nature and not about fundamentals in the uh, economies. And we had all of that during the crisis. And of course, the problem here is in order to have mechanisms to deal with those liquidity events, we have to have also mechanisms to avoid free riding by the member countries. And that's why in the monetary union, when we must have a fiscal rule, financial assistance with conditionality, and ultimately the possibility of that restructuring. But all three of these things exist in the euro area, and all three things have been already used. So now, the debate is about now, does this need improvements, changes, or not? But they exist. More on that later. Uh, but there is no debate about the first element. What are the mechanisms to ensure a proper defense to these liquidity events that may happen when any crisis uh, emerges? Well, ultimately, of course, the response would be uh, fiscal union, or euro bonds without a full-fledged fiscal union, but that would require a huge degree of political union, which is not there. Well, excluding that possibility, at least for the moment, because in one day, if this continues, monetary union will have to be completed also in those other areas, but uh, uh, putting that aside for the moment, the alternative is to have what Iken Green called a normal central bank a normal central bank that besides ensuring price stability also uses open market operations that are foreseen in the treaty both to provide liquidity to banks and to markets. Uh, and that would be a normal central bank. The ECB during the crisis, pressed by the crisis, made the strides in that direction um, and that's why there is ultimately the O. Empty. There were questions raised both by Paul and now by Guido Tabellini about the OMT being a full assurance, but it's what exists. It's there. And it would be nevertheless important that in all member countries, legislation would exist that would uh, safeguard uh, that the ECB would not be challenged every time it uses these unconventional measures to deal with that fundamental issue of a monetary union. Now, turning, oh, I had all this speech in this slide. Uh, turning now to the next crisis. What type of next crisis? Two types. It will be either a aggregate demand shock coming from the outside, there will be a world economy downturn in the next two years, I think that it is a certainty it will happen, it will come either from the US directly or from emerging markets, or both. Uh, it's in the cards, uh, I won't go into that. And the second type of crisis that we may face, next crisis, is the Italian situation. So, turning to the first one, let's, uh, uh, I have here my list of things, what uh, should be done or should exist. Well, the first thing is monetary policy will have to respond to this uh, uh, demand shock coming from the outside, and the only response available is to go into yield curve control, meaning like uh, in Japan, focusing on medium term uh, interest rates. It's, uh, it's cheaper to do that than a full-fledged uh, QE. So 
that's mostly what is available, and if necessary, in such a situation, it may require, I don't know, going beyond the self-imposed limit of 33% if it will be necessary. Second, that will not be enough. Monetary policy is limited in the present situation, um, and so we will need an expansionary fiscal policy uh, with an European coordinated uh, fiscal stance. It would be nice to have a rainy day fund available already when it comes. Very likely it will not be, but it would be important and point to the need of such an instrument in the monetary union. Third, well, there should be a completion of banking union, mainly eddies and the backstops, uh, in order to enhance the confidence in the uh, um, uh, banking sector. That would be important if a new shock comes uh, of that type. Fourth, we should avoid, during this period, thinking about the next crisis, destabilizing markets with risk, risky initiatives on debt restructuring, ESM enhancements, more on about that later, and high concentration capital charges on banks. Both things will be now, now destabilizing. Th five, create an European safe asset. And that's, for me, the more important thing of all. Because my view is that an European safe asset is the only, only stabilizing solution to the problem of the doom loop and the concentration of banks' portfolios in domestic debt. There is no other stabilizing uh, solution, in my view. And it's also an essential component of a capital markets union, if indeed that project is taken seriously. Because right until now, it has not been taken seriously, either, I would say, by the Commission, if we look to the 14 proposals, uh, 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 and even less so, by member states. Um, it's a very difficult project, by the way, I recognize that, but either it is serious or not, it seems that it's just a slogan. Um, six, start discussions to revamp the Stability Pact along the lines uh, of the 7 plus 7 and especially the uh, Conseil d'Analyse Economique uh, note, more recent, with two big adjustments on that note. First, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, less procyclical solution that it uh, entails must not be only on the, on the side of the revenues when a recession comes. When a severe recession comes, there should be also an exception like the one that exists now about the expenditure path. It's not in either proposal. And the second uh, adjustment is indeed to not accept the role of national uh, fiscal councils that, according to the proposals, would fix everything. The, uh, the potential output, the inflation, the nominal growth, uh, and the path for expenditure for the five years and for the next year. Everything would be fixed by national councils. We must be very careful that we should not digitalize more national political authorities in this domain. So these two adjustments uh, are essential in my view. And we should expand the set of macroprudential instruments, um, uh, which is necessary. The Italian crisis, well, there is OMT and nothing else. Now, Few words on the uh, why I don't agree with the capital uh, charges on concentration and so on. Well, there are good reasons for own bias. I won't go into that. There is the macro channel, meaning that even if the banks would diversify their portfolio of sovereign debt, if the sovereign goes down, the banks also would go down or sof suffer hugely. So diversification is not enough to kill the feedback loop. It will be very important. And let me show uh, the uh, average 60-day rolling correlations between the CDS premium of sovereigns and the CDS premium of uh, uh, banks and of non-financial corporations, both in five periphery countries and in five core countries there were no data for the other two core countries. Um, 
since 2008 until 2017. And as we see, the correlations are very similar, both of banks and non-financial firms. Uh, well, you, you may say uh, correctly, it's just simple correlation, it doesn't prove too much, but I tell you that if we do a uh, regression analysis with control variables for common factors, like uh, in the paper by Asharya and others of 2014, the conclusion comes the same. There is no much difference between the effect of what happens to the sovereign on banks or, or non-financial firms. So the macro channel is there. But more than that, there is another point, which is that there are papers now uh, showing that going into the diversification that it is looked for by the proposals on the table, that would result in an increase of risk of the overall portfolio of the banks and that the induced diversification to other sovereign bonds does not improve the tail risk either for single countries or for the EU banking system. Both these conclusions come in this uh, uh, paper by Giusio Craig and Paterlini uh, that simulates uh, different simple rebalancing uh, rules of the portfolios and find uh, that the likely portfolios that result from some such higher diversification requirements will generally increase the risk of most banks in the euro area. And also that the tail risk of such portfolios the, uh, show similar levels of tail risk both for single countries and for the EU banking system. The same conclusion comes from a more recent paper by uh, published, a working paper published by the SRB uh, that shows, makes several numerical simulations of the reaction of banks rebalancing their portfolios to six measures, either price-based or quantitative-based, and conclude as, they, as I show there, that there is a fundamental tension between lowering concentration and lowering credit risk in the absence of an euro area low risk asset. None of the reforms unambiguously achieve both, as this table indicates from their paper. In some cases, regulatory reform can have perverse effects. So this proves my point that the only solution is to have an European safe asset, which is now a crucial reform. And I see it as an asset test about if member countries are serious about uh, addressing these uh, issues. Turning to that restructuring, I'll be very quick. Um, the, I, as I said uh, at the beginning, ultimately that restructuring must be there. It is there because indeed uh, the ESM has to ask the Commission for a debt sustainability analysis as a condition to embark into a program. Now, what, is, what are the proposals to make that restructuring more likely? Well, in the 7 plus 7, there are two. The competence migrates from the Commission to the intergovernmental ESM uh, with the, gov the governance that it has uh, and also, it says in the paper that then they should disclose uh, what will be the criteria of such, uh, of such uh, um, DSA. And then the uh, present IMF uh, uh, model uh, procedure is done as an example. But as the paper 7 plus 7 says, when introducing such a policy, it is essential to ensure that it is, does not give rise to the expectation that some of the present debts of high debt countries will inevitably be restructuring, triggering financial instability in debt markets. And what they call the transitional uh, problem, they do not solve it in the paper and perhaps is very difficult to solve because they only talk about delaying implementation, gradual implementation. That would not avoid the instability in debt markets if these measures, this enhancement of the presumption of a debt restructuring would be approved now. 
now. And also, of course, the idea of giving more powers to a pure intergovernmental uh, uh, body, which by nature is, of course, much more political, is not an, insti an European institution in the treaty. I would agree with the enhancement of the ESM, even transforming it into an EMF, if it would be made an European institution. But that, of course, requires a treaty change. It's difficult, but that's the only political way in times of populism. We should not fuel more uh, populism by giving such powers with huge distributional consequences to bodies that are not accountable. Uh, final, finally, on the revamped stability pact, I already said uh, what would be my approach with the two corrections that I think are fundamental to the proposals on the table. Uh, to conclude, well, in the short term, unfortunately, I see no political will to, uh, uh, to approve any meaningful, meaningful reforms, especially while the, uh, the Italian standoff lasts. Nothing will be uh, possible, uh, and so we have to wait for some of these things. So if the next crisis is an economic downturn or a recession, which is a possibility, monetary policy and appropriate fiscal policy will have to deal with it. And fortunately, the fiscal situation and the external account situation of member countries, including all the periphery, is now much healthier, and so the euro area is more robust to withstand such a shock. Well, then there is the second type of crisis, the Italian crisis, which will maybe be more difficult to overcome if indeed it will progress as all indications show. So it's very uncertain, but I put there what I call three fixed points. The first one is financial markets will dictate the outcome. Italy cannot win against the markets if the markets decide to ask for more higher yields uh, from Italy. That's a fixed point. The second fixed point that is that ultimately the, uh, uh, the Commission has no uh, means to impose comply, full compliance on any member country uh, on this uh, SGP uh, compliance on that point, uh, especially in countries like France or Germany in the past, or now Italy, that are net contributors to the EU budget. So not even retaining funds could be used as a leverage to impose compliance. And so, and third fixed point, the EU will help only if there is an agreement on compliance, there is cooperation of the member states and uh, or an OMT program with all its conditionals. I exclude the scenario of Italy wanting to leave for many reasons, including, of course, the majority view of Italians. The June Eurobarometer gives 61% of the Italian population in favor of the the euro area. An October of post poll shows 68% in favor of remaining in an hypothetical referendum, and a recent demos poll uh, indicates that 58% of Italians want the government to compromise with the EU. So, concluding, uh, I think that the euro area will withstand and overcome at least the next crisis. Thank you. So maybe, maybe, Peter, this is your turn now to close this panel. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, given the time for brevity, I want to keep my slides in the virtual drawer. Just a few uh, words of comments. Thank, thanks a lot for the invitation. Two disclaimers to start with. Yes, I'm not Olivier Gerson. Uh, secondly, Although I also work for the Commission, Olivier Gerson is my boss, of course, as it goes, nothing what I say can be construed to express the views of the Commission. That would even have been the case if Olivier would have spoken here. Having said that, I do think, actually, I'm uh, very pleased about the high degree of consensus I heard this afternoon. And actually, particularly pleased as this degree of consensus goes pretty significantly beyond the degree of consensus we often meet when we talk with member states on such issues. They are typically what we say here en passant, of course, 
finalized banking union, everybody agreed here, and I agree also, just because we agree here, this is not yet, this is not yet done. Indeed, I think it was Mr. Sapir who mentioned that uh, one constituent element of understanding what is going on right now, or what is not going on right now, is the lack of trust between member states, which is running low. Um, for we can argue endlessly into the night where that is from, but that limits the discussion quite a bit. Also on, of course, the, the discussion of risk sharing versus risk reduction. I do appreciate what you and Owen have said in the very beginning, that this distinction is sometimes a bit fake, as if this were two sides of a virtual balance sheet, well, uh, very ill-construed uh, and considered. Clearly, both, both these elements have to be uh, uh, calibrated intelligently. Risk sharing is a mean of risk reduction if properly calibrated. Of course, the converse holds if not well cons uh, construed, it can re uh, lead uh, on a net terms to a net a negative outcome in terms of moral hazard, very clear. So we have to overcome this a bit sterile discussion of risk sharing versus risk reduction. Just to be on the record on risk reduction, uh, we, did, we have done a lot. We do hope that member states, oh, sorry, the co-legislators in the European Union will finalize two big remaining packages, the banking package as proposed by the Commission in 2016. We hope we have a good chance. And a package on non-performing loans as proposed by the Commission in March this year. We have to do that. I mean, here we all agree that goes without saying. Unfortunately, it still has to be delivered by policymakers. And beyond that, clearly, of course, I would want to add risk reduction, of course, I did not see any difference, includes not just making institutions or markets more resilient by beefing up uh, lo loss absorbing capacity or capital, but of course also by reducing debt in the system. And clearly we don't just talk here about sovereign debt, but very importantly also about debt in some countries rising quite rapidly in the private, corporate, and or household sector. That is part of risk reduction, what is needed. Uh, that we need on top of that a better sharing of risk via private sector channels and public sector is obvious. And yes, theoretically it might be possible to derive an optimal mix of public versus private sector risk sharing in the euro area, but I find this rather academic, oh, academic, sorry, uh, esoteric, I should rather say, uh, <laughs> in the current sense, because we are far away on both fronts from the optimum right now uh, in, in the euro area. We need both more, very clearly, uh, and the, we don't have the luxury yet to think about once we have come close, perhaps the optima, what the exact optimum is. Um, there was a lot of discussion on uh, debt restructuring. Yes, that is, of course, part of the issues which should be considered. I think I also sense a sort of consensus here that this is not something perhaps to be drawn out too much in public or too explicitly. Yes. We all, uh, it's clear that such an event, even in the euro area, has a non-zero probability, obvious. Also obvious that competent authorities, be it commission and or ESM or others, have to properly prepare for it. But thirdly, there is, uh, I'm, I'm not yet convinced that a lot has to be gained from making public publicly available rules, exactly for the reasons which some of you conveyed. This could just rather destabilize the system by, by uh, triggering speculative runs and actually make then the likelihood of false 
events, i.e. restructuring, without the uh, underlying need, more likely would be a serious mistake. Um, I am a bit um, coming from the Commission, perhaps I'm professionally def uh, deformed, but I'm a bit hesitant towards going for further fragmentation of the club of our member states, i.e. going down the road what André suggested of sort of like creating first a coalition or a club of the better shaped member states which can advance. I do understand the logic of incentive compatibility, I all understand it, but we have already quite a rich variation of institutional setting and of, of not only market but also institutional fragmentation in the EU. So I think it deserves more thinking on that. But okay, it's certainly one of the issues to be discussed. On clearly, I do understand and I heard with uh, great interest the call for a for the also going beyond banking in union, beyond capital market union, which are crucially important, also towards the wider package of what the Commission proposed in further deepening economic and monetary union. Indeed, we do consider these are in, uh, essential elements to make us better equipped for the next crisis, humbly noting that we don't exactly know where the next crisis comes from, but uh, still being better equipped. This includes clearly the European Ma Monetary Fund. This clearly includes a stronger fiscal capacity and this includes at least the thinking about a European safe asset. Uh, we know the politics is not ideal surrounding this uh, concept, but this doesn't make it wrong. It makes it perhaps more rather a long-term project. Indeed, it would, uh, such, uh, would indeed help at various fronts. It could, depending on its calibration, actually strengthen market discipline, and it could uh, also address better the doom, the doom loop which we have talked about. So I'm happy that this has come onto the table. Um, I would like to finish here and thank you for this great contribution I heard from left and right here. Um, I think there is no much uh, time left uh, for further questions, so probably you need to move to, to the dinner, right? So thank you very much to all, and thank you for this interesting discussion. Thank you.